You're listening to Rabbi Arya Wolby, Director of Torch, the Torah Outreach Resource Center of Houston. This is the Jewish Inspiration Podcast. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Jewish Inspiration Podcast. To all of our friends on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter, thank you for joining us. Uh, we've discussed over the past couple of weeks, we've discussed the idea of fear. What is fear? As we discussed, what is fear? Remember, we discussed fear is understanding our place, is having the proper perspective. We say every, if you walk into most synagogues, they have a magnificent uh, four words from Psalms, which is Shiviti Hashem Lenegdi Tamid, that I place the Almighty opposite me or in front of me at all times. And that is a very, very important idea to put things into the proper perspective. And we're going we're gonna to connect this with Pesach, which is just this weekend ahead of us. Um, we're going to talk about it and connect it to this idea of Yira. But the idea of why it's so important is because in order to live a stress-free life, in order to have a life that is without stress, we have to have that proper perspective. It's very easy to get carried away in the world we're living in and thinking, oh, oh, oh my goodness, how am I going to control this circumstance? How am I going to control that? And people don't know how they're going to make make ends meet. People don't know how things are going to work out ultimately. And what we need to constantly be rem- reminded, and we spoke about this in the previous weeks, in trusting Hashem, that is that we work on putting our trust in Hashem. Hashem will get us the job we want, uh, and the job we need, the job that's right for us. Hashem will find us the things that we need, but we have to relinquish our own will to control everything and put it in the hands of Hashem. Hashem li lo ira, we mentioned. Hashem is with me when Hashem, when I know that Hashem is with me, meaning I put my trust in Hashem, I have nothing to worry. I have nothing to fear. I don't know if I mentioned this story, but I, I need to share an amazing story. I, I mentioned this in the, we said this in the Musser Mondays class two weeks ago, uh, but I think it's so relevant to Pesach. I want to share it here as well. If I shared it already, please forgive me. I apologize for, for, uh, for the, uh, for, for repeating it again, but it's an amazing story. The great holy Levi Yitzchak from Arditchev was the Seder night, and he's about to start the Seder, and all his Hasidim, all his followers are standing around, and they're ready to get the Seder started. And the Rebbe says, before I start the Seder, I need tabak. Tabak is snuff. I need snuff from Turkey. Now, then there was an embargo between uh, 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 Russia and Turkey. They were in a war, and you were not allowed to have any Turkish items. You weren't allowed to have Turkish snuff. You weren't allowed to have Turkish linen. You weren't allowed to have Turkish rugs. You weren't allowed to have any of that. But the Rebbe said to his, his Hasidim, we're not starting to say that till I get some Turkish snuff. He said, you know, we're not allowed to. If there's a penalty of death for anybody who's found with snuff made from Turkey in their possession. Right? He says, I don't care. I want that snuff. So they went house to house. And they asked all of the people in the town, does anybody know where there is, does anybody have snuff from Tur- Turkish snuff? And people were saying, you know, it's, uh, you're not allowed to have it and this and that. But at the end of the day, they got it. They got it. They bring it back to the holy Levi Yitzchak from Bardichev and they give him the snuff. He says, thank you so much. He says, now before we begin the Seder, I need one more thing. I need a Turkish fabric. A specific Turf- Turkish fabric. And they tell the Rebbe, Rebbe, don't you know there's an embargo? There's a life sentence for anybody who is caught with this, this product. He says, I don't care. I cannot begin to say it until I find this Turkish uh, fabric. So they go around house to house and they finally found, find the fabric and they bring it to the Rebbe. And now the Rebbe is okay, ready to start the Seder. He says, one second, one more thing I need before we start the Seder. He says, I want you to go to all the homes and I want you to bring me chametz. I want you to bring me chametz. And they look at the Rebbe, they're like, what are you talking about? He says, go, I'm not starting the Seder till you find chametz. And they go house to house and they search house to house and they cannot find one morsel of chametz. And they go back to the Rebbe and they say to the Rebbe, I'm sorry, but we could not find chametz. He says, look, Hashem, look how beautiful your children are. He says, there's a death penalty for anybody who has snuff, and we can find snuff. 
There is a death penalty for anybody who has fabric. And yet we found fabric. But there's no death penalty for someone having chametz. You just commanded it in your Torah that there shouldn't be chametz in the Jewish homes. And there's not a single morsel of chametz in any of the Jewish homes. Look at your children. Look how amazing they are. That without without a death penalty, without without any of those fearsome you know uh, punishments, nobody has chametz in their house. You know why? Because your children are the most special children in the world. Why? Because we fear Hashem. Because we understand the perspective that is necessary in order for us to succeed in our lives. We understand that we need to have a relationship that is clear between us and the Almighty. What Pesach does is Pesach puts everything into that frame of mind. We realize the Almighty loves us. He takes us out of bondage. He takes us out of exile. And he brings us to freedom. God splits the sea for us. He feeds us 40 years, day and night, every single day we get our mana. On time. Delivered. The most amazing thing. The Jewish people are taken care of. All we need is perspective. All we need is an understanding for us to know exactly who, what, where, when, exactly the relationship that we have between the between us and the Almighty. So that's a little bit to get us into the frame, frame of mind of the Seder. We have to understand that there's an amazing, amazing piece on the Seder. And I think this is probably the most powerful, powerful thing I've ever learned from my grandfather. My grandfather, every Seder night, would say this. He'd say an amazing thing. It says in the in the Seder, Pesach Seder, in the, in the Haggadah, we say a beautiful collection of praises to the Almighty. In the song Dayenu, we all love to sing Dayenu, right? Day, Dayenu, Day, Dayenu, right? And what are we saying in those words? Dayenu means it would be enough. Enough, right? It would be enough. We say it's, you know, it's like you have, you know, you're, so you're being so, you're so, you know, someone takes care of you, they invite you to their house, and they give you a clean bed to sleep in, and they give you food to eat, and 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 and, and delicious drinks to drink, and they take care of you, and they, they give you a ride wherever you need. And you say, you know what, if you only took me in, that would be enough. But no, you gave me food to drink, food to eat, and you gave me drinks to drink, and you gave me a ride wherever I needed, and you gave me money, and you gave me, right? You're thanking them for each thing. If you would have just taken one, it would have been enough, right? And what we're saying to the Almighty is had you only split the sea, that would be enough. If you would, you know, pass us on dry land, that would be enough. If you would just protect us in the desert, that would be enough. But Hashem gave us everything. Now, one of the amazing pieces that we add in this amazing, amazing song is the thanks to Hashem for bringing us to Mount Sinai. If you had only brought us to Mount Sinai but didn't give us the Torah, Dayenu, that would be enough. Now, I don't know about you. It's like the equivalent, and the example I give many, many times about this is that it's the equivalent of me taking my children to the ice cream store. And my children saying in return, if you only brought us to the ice cream store but didn't give us ice cream, that would be enough. What? That doesn't make any sense. Why take me to the ice cream store if you're not going to give me the ice cream? Why bring us to Mount Sinai and not give us the Torah? What would be so great about that? Right? That's a good question. That's a great question. Why in the world would you bring us to Mount Sinai and not give us the Torah? Would that be so great? That would be so awesome. Our sages tell us an amazing thing. Because the Torah is teaching us an incredible, incredible lesson. We, Judaism is not a religion. Judaism is a relationship. God didn't bring us to Mount Sinai to give us a Torah. God brought us to Mount Sinai to give us a relationship. It's an amazing, let this, let this sink in. The reason for going to Mount Sinai was to get a relationship it wasn't to get the Torah. We've brought this many different examples comparing it to an engagement where the girl says all accounts is, is the ring. No, it's not the ring. The ring symbolizes the relationship, right? That's what makes the ring special. Someone just uh, randomly on the street gives you a ring. You're not going to feel necessarily that this is such a special ring to want to show it off to everyone unless it's really, really expensive, right? But, but typically, it's not going to have any meaning. 
Why? Because the ring only gets its meaning for the relationship that's behind it. So the whole relationship is encompassed in this ring. The ring that we got from the Almighty is the Torah. But what makes it special is the relationship behind it. You understand? That means that had Hashem only taken us to Mount Sinai, given us the Torah, meaning, the, and not given us the Torah, but we would have that relationship, that would be enough. So why do we need the Torah? Our sages ask, why do we need the Torah then? If, we, if it's all about the relationship, what do we need the Torah for? Sages say an incredible thing. And that is that the purpose of the Torah is like a souvenir. When you go on vacation, you're talking about, right, Bobby and all of you on, on TorchZoom.com, right? So you're all talking about what you're going to do now that we have vaccines and we're feeling a little bit the opening of the, of the gates of, uh, of the pandemic. They're finally opening and now we can go. We can feel some freedom. We can, right? So now t- what are we going to do? So everyone's talking about the vacations they're going to go to, all the places they're going to go. And it's, it's, it's very nice, right? It's very exciting. What do you do when you go on vacation? You bring back something special. What do you bring back that's special? Well, everybody has something else that they enjoy, right? So some people collect – I collect shot glasses. So for those of you who don't know, right? But it's only from places that I went to. It doesn't help for me to just get shot glasses from random places, right? I only want to go from from places that I actually went to. So everyone has different souvenirs. Some people collect postcards and some people collect magnets and some keychains and some spoons. You know, they have all of these different things that people collect from various different places that they go to. What is the purpose of all of this? Why do people collect these souvenirs from these places? Who needs it? What's the purpose of it? Or say, just tell us an amazing thing. The Torah is a souvenir as well. The purpose of the souvenir is to bring back and recall that great experience. So what happens? You go to uh, Antarctica. You go to Antarctica and you want to remember, now I'm going to go back to Houston. I don't want to just forget my experience in Antarctica. So I'm going to buy something. I'm going to buy a keychain. Every time I look at that keychain, you will say, oh, you were in Antarctica? Yeah, you have no idea. And you go through, you recall the entire experience again and again. You go to Mexico, you go to Israel, you go wherever you go around the world and you bring back that souvenir and you see it on your fridge. You're like, oh, you remember that? And you're sitting there with your coffee like, oh, and you bring back that whole experience again. You relive that whole experience. The Torah is one big souvenir that has 613 reminders, special reminders to bring back the experience of the revelation that God connected with us on Mount Sinai. That is the purpose of the entire Torah. The entire Torah, the Jewish people are standing there and they're like, they had this awesome ex- revelation at Mount Sinai. And now they're saying, oh, what are we going to do now? How are we going to hold this in for forever? What are we going to do to keep this experience alive so that 3,300 years later when we're sitting at Mount, when we're sitting in Houston, Texas, How are we going to recall that experience? How are we going to bring that relationship to life again? Hashem says, I'm going to give you 613 souvenirs. That each one of them has the ability. Every time you pass the mezuzah on the door, you can feel that connection again. Every time a person puts on tefillin, every every time a person keeps Shabbos, every single one of those mitzvahs has the ability to bring back that relationship to its original state. It's like a woman who's wearing her engagement ring. Every moment she looks at that ring, she's bringing up the entire relationship again. The entire connection that she has is brought up by looking at that ring. When we look in our Torah, when we study our Torah, when we experience and observe the Torah, what we're doing is bringing back that connection. So when we talk about this trait of yira, of perspective, what we need to do is recognize the relationship and it's and how special it is, the relationship between us and the Almighty. The Almighty loves us. The Almighty wants good for us. The Almighty wants to, to, to have us close. That's the goal, the whole goal, the whole purpose of everything we have in our lives is for that closeness, is for that, for that connection. And that's what we're yearning for. What we're yearning for 
is yearning for the connection between us and the Almighty to be solid. That's what we're looking for. So, during our prayers, what do we do? By the way, just going back to the Dayenu. So now it makes a lot of sense. Had God only brought us to Mount Sinai and didn't give us the Torah, why would that be sufficient? Why do we say Dayenu? That would have been enough. You know why? Because the whole purpose of bringing us to Mount Sinai was not to give us the Torah. That was the added bonus we got. That was the added bonus. We got a treat. What was the treat? We also got the souvenir to remember that relationship. But what we really went to Mount Sinai for was to have a relationship with God. For God to reveal himself to the Jewish people. Where the Jewish people heard with their own ears, Anochi Hashem Alekecha, I am Hashem your God. That is the, the purpose of why the Jewish people went to, went, uh, were brought to Mount Sinai. Not to receive the Torah. The Torah, it, the purpose of the Torah is for us to have a recollection, for us to have a way to bring back that experience every day. And we also got that, by the way. So we didn't only get the relationship, but we got the tools, the mechanism for us to bring back and recall all of the amazing miracles, all of the amazing relationship, all the amazing miracles that we experience every single day of our lives. So when we stand in prayer, during prayer, you know what we do? We ha- we, what we do is we don't say words. I once had an individual tell me, uh, I used to have a Shabbos morning class before COVID. I had a Shabbos morning class where I would, I would do the talk about the parsha and we talk about prayer. And I had one individual, and a- after the class, I would tell them, here, go into the con- go into the synagogue, you can go into the main sanctuary and join the congregation, feel part of the of the whole community. So I had one individual, he says to me, I- I'm-, I'm out, I'll see you, I'll see you later. I said, what's going on? Is everything okay? He says, look, me and prayer don't get along. I said, what do you mean you and prayer don't get along? He says, you have to understand, I'm so frustrated from prayer. I'm so frustrated. I said, why are you frustrated from prayer? What, what-, what happened? He says, you have to understand, I go to synagogue. And all the all all of the prayer, I'm running after the chazan, trying to figure out where he's holding, turning pages back and forth. By the time I'm done, I'm like, oh, finally, we're done with this uh, with this prayer service. I said, that's not what our prayer is. That's not what our prayer is. Many people think that prayer is following along with what the chazan. No, that's not what prayer is. Prayer is closing your eyes and opening your heart and talking to God. That's it. That's what prayer is. Thank Hashem. Thank Hashem for everything He gives you. Thank Hashem for your health. Thank Hashem for your success. Thank Hashem for your challenges. Thank Hashem for every single... You can move your fingers. Thank Hashem. You can stand upright. Thank Hashem. You can open your eyes. Thank Hashem. You can eat. Thank Hashem. You can breathe air. Thank Hashem. That's what prayer is. Prayer is talking to God. Now, so why do we have a prayer book? So that we don't leave things out. Because, you know, imagine this. Imagine if you put together a list of all the things you're grateful for. Would you try to memorize it? Or you, you, the list of, it would be a thousand things. You'd have an entire list, page after page after page, of all the things you're grateful for. It's very likely you'd leave a couple of things out. And that's what the prayer book is there for, to remind us of all the things we need to be grateful for. In fact, in the introductory part of the prayer, we, it's called Psuke de Zimra, the, 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 the verses of praise. What do we do there in the verses of praise? We talk about how all of the elements of the world, all of the, um, all of the birds, how they thank Hashem, and how all the angels thank Hashem, and all, how everyone praises Hashem. What, what is the idea of that? The idea is so that we should, re, you know, bring to a, an understanding for ourselves of how we need to be thankful to Hashem. How we need to be grateful to Hashem. That's the goal. The goal is to talk to God directly. To understand that this relationship is a relationship of love. It's a relationship with the Almighty wants that connection with us. Hashem wants that closeness with us. All we need to do is open up our heart and say thank you Hashem. I was once listening to a lecture and I, the, the rabbi said that the whole purpose of prayer is giving thanks. That's it. The whole purpose, everything. You want, you want to know what we do in prayer? What's the purpose of prayer? One thing. Say thank you to Hashem. I said, what do you mean? Where's the, he says, Adam and Eve, what did they not do? 
they didn't have proper appreciation. In the Garden of Eden, their sin ultimately was they didn't appreciate what they had. This is what we need to do. The essence of all of our prayers is to give thanks and to repair for that lack of appreciation that Adam and Eve had. To never enjoy from one thing from this world without proper appreciation. To never take for granted one great gift that the Almighty gives us. And by the way, we have an endless bounty of gifts that the Almighty gives us. It's endless. The Almighty gives us so much good. The Almighty gives us so much blessing. And all we need to do is open our eyes and recognize and appreciate all of that goodness, all of that kindness. And that's part of year is recognizing, putting things into proper perspective so we can properly understand what these gifts are. Right, so so the way it should properly be done, first is Hashem loves when we care about someone else. That It means a lot to the Almighty when He sees, look, Rani is taking time out of her day to pray for someone else. That has an unbelievable power and an unbelievable value in the eyes of the Almighty. Where the Almighty says, look at my children. They could be doing a thousand other things right now, but instead what are they spending their time doing? Praying for one another. That's why the, the Talmud says that if you don't know the name, because you're supposed to say the name and their mother's name, someone who's ill, if you don't know their name, you don't need to say their name. God knows who your friends are. The fact that you feel that love and that 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 you're compelled to pray on behalf of your friend, Hashem says, wow, there's nothing more beautiful than that. That in itself is a merit. But what we say is we say, Hashem, you're the you're the 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 be all and end all of our health. If Hashem decides we're healthy, we're, we, we're healthy. And if Hashem, how many times have we heard people who were afraid of something really tragic or something really really severe, and then the doctor says, I don't know, it's gone. I, we we saw it in the images. We see it. Everything shows right that it uh, and, and and it's just not there. Hashem decides to take it away. Hashem decides to give it. Hashem decides to take it. And that's the idea is we first have to acknowledge and appreciate everything Hashem does. And then we say, Hashem, now please open up your, your mercy, your gates of mercy for this individual who needs healing. Right? But it comes with a whole, uh, uh, a whole introduction of praise, praising Hashem, recognizing, right? You know, uh, it just, uh, just think of it as yourself for a second. If you had, a, you know, a nephew, and the nephew wants something from you, would you want your nephew to just come and say, hey, uh, Aunt uh, Ronnie, uh, can I have your chocolate chip cookies, right? You know, like, uh, say hello, say, hey, my favorite aunt, right? You'd give, give some praises, butter me up a little bit before you just jump for the cookies, right? And that's the way, in, in a way, we relate to the Almighty the way we relate to our fellow men. You first praise the Almighty. The first thing we do is we thank Hashem for all of His kindness, all of His goodness. And then we can start asking for personal things. Uh, so my grandfather says like this. He says, imagine if they created a thermos, right? I love my Yeti mug, right? The Yeti is, it's, so, it's incredible. I can fill it up with hot coffee at 8 o'clock in the morning, and at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, it's still hot. It's really amazing. Now, what would happen if they created a thermos that would be hot for like 3,000 years? That would be remarkable, right? It would be remarkable. Like 3,000 years, it's still hot. Can you imagine? Right? Well, that's what the Torah is. The Torah is a thermos. It's that souvenir thermos that what it does is it keeps that, that passion, it keeps that love, it keeps that freshness of that revelation from Mount Sinai all the way to today. We today, we say to ourselves, oh, look at us. We're, we're such a poor generation spiritually, right? And for us to be able to connect with the ideas, with the vision, with the clarity that they had at Mount Sinai, we're so far from it. We're so far removed. Hashem says, no. We have the ability today to connect the way they connected back then. We have the ability today to learn and to grow just as they did back then. Because we have the Torah. And the Torah is that thermos that keeps the heat of that relationship solid for forever, for eternity. Which is why we're, we, we're obligated to learn Torah. Why? To keep that relationship going. Right? Is anybody, does, is it easy for anybody to love their, their spouse, 
10 years later, as much as they did at the beginning of the relationship with the freshness, I'll give you an example. Well, the, well the, the way it should work is you love them even more, right? Not less. But how does that come with a lot of work of constantly working yourself? But let me ask you a question. When you say I love you for the first time to your spouse, there's almost like a preparation of I'm, I'm, I'm about to be at that point and ready to say that, right? It's not just taken lightly. But what happens 20 years, 10, 20 years later? I love you. And you don't realize who you're even talking to. Right? I just said, okay, goodbye. I love you. Right? Oh, one second. That was uh, Comcast. I was just talking to the customer service at Comcast. Right? We don't even know who we're saying it to. Right? Because it becomes habit. The idea is for it to stay fresh. And that's what the Torah does. The Torah keeps the relationship between us and the Almighty fresh. So that every day, every day, it's a new, fresh relationship. We recognize again and again and again the love that Hashem has for us. All right. So now we have to also remember that at the end of our life, we come before the heavenly courts and it says, our sages tell us that we're going to be shown a movie, so to speak. We're going to be shown a movie of everything that we've done. I'll tell you a frightening, a frightening vision. It's a true story. I was standing at Walmart, the local neighborhood Walmart, and I go to the self-checkout. I typically don't like waiting online, but if it's necessary, I will, right? Obviously. But if you have the option to do self-checkout, why would you wait online, right? So I go to self-checkout and I scan my items and it says on the screen, it says one item was not scanned. What are you talking about? How do you know one item was not scanned? It was scanned. So they play a video. They play me a video on the screen over there at the checkout counter. All the way up, straight on the ceiling, there's a video that keeps track of all the items that are in the wagon and the items that are scanned. So sometimes it makes a mistake. It's the most frightening thing. And you see a video of yourself at the register scanning the items and you see right every one of your movements are being recorded from a camera that's 30 feet above you. And it's focused in onto your checkout self, self-checkout self uh, register. And I was immediately thinking, look at how the Almighty is teaching us that He records everything. Hashem records every one of our actions. And it's on instant playback. As soon as a person passes away from this world, any of our actions are shown to us. All, every single one of our actions are shown to us. But you know, not only to us, to our, to our ancestors, they're all sitting there like, oh, they're getting their popcorn and they're ready to watch the video of the life of their descendant, right? Who just came into the heavenly realms and they're all sitting and looking at it, right? Now, that's why it's important. Repentance is very, very important because that erases parts of it that are blemished. The parts that are not so good, that's what repentance does. Repentance clears it away. It's not like, not only that, our sages tell us that it makes it into a mitzvah. Because repentance itself is a mitzvah. So if a person does a bad deed, a, a negative act, and then does the incredible mitzvah of teshuva, so the negative act brought them to do the mitzvah. So the neg- a negative act becomes a mitzvah. So they'll they'll have like an edited screen where it'll be like, here's a, right? Instead of it being the bad deed that perhaps a person did because they did tshuva before, because they repented, it now turns it into a positive deed. Amazing. That's the, that's, we're going to have everything shown in front of us. There's no secrets. There's no hiding. Even our intentions, our thoughts, everything is played out. It could be very, very, very embarrassing. That's part of when we talk about euros, to have a proper perspective that there is accountability to everything that we do. People fear failure. Right? We all have some type of fear of failure. But the truth is, and we all know this very, very well from experience, I'm sure we all had uh, failures in our lifetime. Failure only helps you become better. Anytime, I can tell you a very dear friend of mine became uh, very gifted in a specific area of, of, uh, of life. I'm not going to get into it because he might be watching. I don't want to embarrass him. But he became very, very successful in a certain area of life. And I once asked him, what, what prompted you 
to to uh, to to have this success, like to realize that you had this talent. And uh, he said, when I applied for my first opportunity, I was turned down. And I said, I'm going to show them that I can do this. Right? They turned me down, but I'm going to show them that I can still do it. And he became very, very, very successful. You know, Michael Jordan in high school was kicked off the basketball team because he wasn't good enough. It's a true story. He wasn't good enough. Can you imagine if you were that coach who kicks Michael Jordan off the the basketball team? But he, and, and by the way, I heard this also from another athlete, J.J. Watt, right? I don't, is he still with the Texans? I think he was traded out, sadly. But either way, he's always going to be a Houston legend, right? But one of the things he said after he he won his, I think he was the uh, defensive or whatever of the year. He won one of the years that he that he won it. He said, "I want to give special thanks to my coach who said I'll never be anything." Because he was able to that failure pushed him to try even harder to become more successful. We have to realize that failures are only opportunities. Failures aren't a statement. Failures are a part of a process for us to become better people and to don't get caught up in it. Don't get caught up and stuck in the, oh, I can't believe it. My teacher doesn't believe in me. No. Use it as a springboard to to bring about even more success. So, you know, they asked Warren Buffett, how do you, how did you learn to make such good decisions financially? You know what his answer was? I made enough bad decisions. You make the bad decisions, you learn to correct them. If a person doesn't learn from their mistakes, they'll never, they'll never, they'll never become better. They'll just, ah, I'm so, I'm so bad. I'm so terrible. No. Make good decisions. Learn from your bad decisions. Don't get caught up at your bad, uh, uh, by, by your bad decisions. Use them as a springboard to make better decisions, to acquire true year ah, to acquire that perspective that we're talking about. One must regularly contemplate Hashem's wonders and his abundant kindness with us each day. If we look, open up your eyes and look at the look at your day. Look at the you know, Bobby was telling us at the beginning of class, one of the participants here, right? She said, What a wondrous day. That's the way we have to see every single day. Well, just because it's cloudy, cloudy, it's not a wondrous day. Guess what? We're on this side of the grass. It's a wondrous day. It's a wondrous day. And we have to constantly remind ourselves how gifted we are in the world we're living in every single day. Right to acquire year ah, we must regularly contemplate the wonders of Hashem. Never take it for granted. Every single day, see how blessed we are. What an amazing world we're living in. Fear of Hashem is very important to overcome worldly fears. We all have things that we're afraid of. What's going to be if? What happens if? And we have these insurance policies to try to calm us down. We have car insurance if someone dents our car or crashes our car, God forbid, right? And we have home insurance if we have a fire. And we have life insurance so we, you know, we leave something over for our, for our children. But the truth is, is that we have nothing to fear, right? Because in the, in the 5,781 years since Adam, right, Hashem took care of every single one of us. If you look at all of the stories that happened, if you look at the exodus from Egypt, you know, it's an interesting question that we ask. Another thing from the Seder. It's an interesting question. What does the 10 plagues have to do with the question that the children ask? The children ask, Man, Ishtana, right? Why is tonight different? And we start talking about the 10 plagues. What do 10 plagues have to do with it? What do all the questions have to do with anything? Right? What does that have to do with telling the tale? Because what we're trying to do is we're trying to establish what Judaism is. Judaism is about asking questions. That will, that's what we're telling our children. Judaism, you know what we do in Judaism? We ask questions. That's what we do. And you know what else? There's reward and punishment in Judaism. What we're doing in this Pesach Seder is the, these are the essential themes of all of Judaism. Number one is we ask questions. It's not like in other religions you're not allowed to ask questions. You're obligated to ask questions. We teach our children, stand on that chair and ask the questions. You know why? Because we love your questions. Your questions mean so much to us. 
Your questions are wanted. They're desired. This is part of who we are as a Jewish people. We ask questions. But also, the reason why we talk about all these different parts, for example, the ten plagues, like we mentioned previously, is so that our children know that there is a concept of reward and punishment. It shouldn't go without them understanding that every single one of the plagues was a punishment for a specific incident that the Egyptians did. They did this, they got this. They did this, they got this. There is an accountability for every action that we do. And that's us as well, not only the Egyptians, not only the other nations of the world. Us as Jewish people, there's an accountability. The Almighty holds us accountable. When we do good, we get good. When we do no good, we get no good. Now, we have to understand why certain things happen. We can't answer everything in, in the scope of this class. It's not, it's, not, it's not for us to really go in. But every person individually needs to internalize. Why did this happen to me? Why, did Hashem, why is Hashem putting me through this challenge? And there's a special assistance from above for us to have that revelation to understand why certain things happen to us. We, uh, the, uh, the, the translation to the word when we talk about fear of Hashem means accountability. That's essentially what it means. Accountability. Okay. How do we acquire this fear? So there are two main ways that we acquire it. Number one is through prayer. And like we mentioned previously, when we pray, what we're doing is we're communicating with the Almighty. We're talking to Hashem. And then what we do is step number two is learning His Torah. When we learn Torah, we're able to influence ourselves, our consciousness, our subconsciousness into having a relationship with God. Where we understand that there is accountability. That we understand that Hashem is in control of everything. You know, education today... There's only one way to educate our children. I asked this to my grandfather uh, of blessed memory. Uh, I asked him, I said, Saba, how do we ensure that our children go on the right path in this generation? He said, to, it used to be that you can educate your children with a stick, right? Back in the olden days, they would hit, they would spank. They would, today, you can't do that. He says, that's unacceptable today, not because of culture. Well, it is because of culture, but but it, but it, it's it's... We have to understand that the way in which our children grow up today is very, very different. There's only one way you can educate your children today, and that's with love, with happiness. Children today need to know that they're loved by their parents. Children today need to know that they're appreciated by their parents. We can't knock our kids down because today the streets are very warm. They're very welcoming and friendly. It used to be that you couldn't not be a religious person. Because you weren't accepted elsewhere. You were either Christian, Muslim, Jewish, and you had to be in one of those camps. You couldn't just say, oh, well, I'm an atheist. Oh, it used to be. Then you're called a loser, right? Today, you have many, many. Today, you have a, 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 a variation of a million different types of ways a person can live their life. Because the streets are very warm and welcoming for anyone. If we want our children to have that connection with the Almighty, they have to understand that there is love in this world. And the way we give it to them is from a from parent to child. You know, there used to be a phrase that people used to say in the early days of the early 1900s when people were immigrating into the United States. People would say, I spoke to a friend of mine. He told me that his grandfather got 52 jobs a year. He'd get a job on Sunday morning. And he didn't show up on Shabbos. He got fired because he can't work on Shabbos, right? They say, oh, you don't show up on Shabbos? You're fired. <laughs> Next Sunday morning, he got a new job, right? Imagine you get 52 jobs a year. So people sometimes relented and they said, it's as schwer as I need. It's difficult to be a Jew. But that's not true. It's not true. We have a song that we sing in our synagogue. Every Shabbos, we try to sing it. And it's exactly the opposite. It's gishmak to be a yid. Gishmak to be a yid means it's awesome to be a yid. It's awesome to be a Jew. And we have to remember that. We have to feel it. We have to, we have, to have a connection to that. But that's what destroyed Judaism when people said, oh, it's difficult to be a Jew. It's not true. It's awesome to be a Jew. Yeah, there are challenges. But it's awesome to be a Jew. Yira. When we talk about fear, it means strengthening through the realness of our emunah, 
the more faith we have, and we bring that faith to in, make it clear in our daily existence, in our daily consciousness, to learn, to grow, to connect on a daily basis, and to make it real in our lives. You know, there's there's a uh, a statement that was said by the founder of the the why why the Rosh Hashiva of why you. Rabbi Soloveitchik used to say, do you daven to daven or do you daven to be done with davening? Some people feel like their prayer is a debt. I have to do my, my pay my debt. So I go to shul and I pray and I, and, I, and I pay my debt. Or do you pray to talk to God? Very different way of looking at prayer. Prayer shouldn't be a debt. We don't, God doesn't need our prayers. God loves our prayers, desires. Why? Because the prayer is a connection between us and the Almighty. We have to remember that. We have to remember that that we need to communicate with God. That's what fear of Hashem is, is having that clarity. Now, there is one more element of fear, and that's fear of death, right? Fear of death. Everybody is afraid of death. Everybody has that fear. Why? Because there's accountability after death. We all know that. There is accountability after death, right? It should be a fear that we haven't accomplished what life, our life's goal or mission. And that's the real fear that when we talk, when we think of death, it shouldn't be a fear that, that stifles us or that, 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 that complicates our days. But rather, it should be something that empowers us. So we say, you know what? I have so much more I can still accomplish. I have so much more that I want to accomplish. I don't want to have time to waste. I don't have time to wait. I got to go and get it done. So... We're going to end this topic of fear. Hopefully, we'll be able to take these lessons that we've discussed and internalize them and bring them into our consciousness. And we'll be able to bring them into our daily lives and live with the reality of understanding the the connection between the Almighty and us and how much Hashem loves us every single day. But not only that, I want to wish every single one of you a beautiful, terrific, delicious Pesach. Right, Your Pesach should be elevated. It should be holy. It should be loving. It should be fun and enjoyable for all of those who are with you. It should be healthy. And that's one, one of the, 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 the blessings that we bless one another before Pesach is it should be a Chag, a holiday, which is kosher v'sameach. It should be kosher, meaning it should be perfect and pristine in all, its, all, all, in all ways possible and happy. It should be joyous. It should be joyful. We should be enriched through this Pesach. It should be the most beautiful experience ever. So with that, my dear friends, we're going to sign off from Facebook and YouTube and Twitter. I think we, we pushed off of Twitter already a little earlier. I want to thank you all for joining us. If you enjoyed these classes, please like and share them. And we look forward to seeing you at future classes. Yeah, absolutely. We, we don't need to have a wedding ring to be married, right? I don't wear a wedding band, but I'm still married. Right. Uh, the idea is is that the 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 wedding band represents the relationship. It isn't the relationship. It just represents the relationship. If a woman loses her wedding band or her engagement ring, it doesn't mean that she's not married now or engaged. It just represents it. It's sentimental. It 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 it, in, it encapsulates all of the emotions that are in that relationship in one ring. You've been listening to the Jewish Inspiration Podcast, a Torch production. Become a supporter at torchweb.org because your assistance enables more Torah learning around the globe. To find more lessons offered by Torch, please visit torchpodcasts.com.